Good morning on this Sunday, February 19th, and welcome to the Georgia Gang. I'm Deidre Dukes, and for Lori Geary. A portion of the highly anticipated Fulton County special grand jury report on former President Trump and the 2020 election has been released. Opponents of Atlanta's controversial public safety training center head to court to try to halt the project. And big news from former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley as she officially announces she is running for president in 2024. Melita, Bobby Bryant and Martha are all here. The debate and discussion begin right now. From the Fox 5 studios, the Georgia gang starts now. On Thursday, parts of the Fulton County Special Grand Jury's report were released following a nearly year-long investigation into former President Donald Trump and his allies following Georgia's 2020 presidential election. And while the Special Grand Jury, by law, cannot indict anyone, the jurors voted to have their findings made public. For some eight months, a who's who of political leaders testified before a Fulton County Special Grand Jury investigating whether former President Donald Trump or others illegally interfered in Georgia's presidential election. Last month, the grand jury finished its work and voted to recommend that its report be published. This is not simple. After hearing arguments for and against releasing the full report from media lawyers and Fulton County prosecutors, Superior Court Judge Robert McBurney, who oversaw the grand jury, ordered that most of the report would remain sealed while the criminal investigation of Trump and others continues. McBurney released only three portions of the nine-page report. McBurney released the introduction, a little more than one page, but with a critically important finding that over some eight months and 75 witnesses, the grand jury found no widespread fraud took place in the Georgia 2020 presidential election. But the grand jury wrote that they believed perjury may have been committed by one or more witnesses testifying before it. And the grand jurors want District Attorney Fonnie Willis to seek appropriate indictments. Now, we didn't learn whether there are any recommendations on potential criminal charges, but Martha, even partial release of the uh, report provided some insight into the grand jury's findings. And really, we also learned that jurors found by unanimous vote that there was uh, no widespread voter fraud. Well, I think even in that package, you showed more than what we saw of that report. OK, so it was a nine page report. Six pages of it were basically blocked out. But you're right. The final uh, I think it was in the final paragraph where it said there was no uh, no fraud in in the election. And uh, the former president gave out a very interesting statement that he'd been completely exonerated by this report. Um, you, you see that there will be some recommendations anyway for some charges. And look, I'm not going to go after Fonnie Willis. She's the one that took the Atlanta public school teachers to court. And I probably most of those folks were Democrats. OK, so I think she has shown that she is able to, to be fair in these kind of situations. And I, for one, want to read the whole report. I want to see everything. Yeah, Malia, your key takeaways. Well, I think the 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 fact that they said that they were setting forth recommendations for indictments and relevant statues means we will see some indictments. We just have to be patient, and none of us like being patient on legal time instead of reporter time. Um, and then I think the other thing is that we just you know. Fannie Willis, Fannie Willis is bold and gutsy. She took on a six-term, long-entrenched district attorney to win election in 2020. So she's going to be dotting her I's, crossing her T's, and making sure that whatever indictments she does bring will be legally correct and ready to prosecute. And Brian, perhaps some of the uh, biggest news to come out of this portion of the report that was released is that the jury is recommending that uh, the DA decide whether to go to another grand jury to pursue those indictments. Right. And look, my big question here is, when is this going to end? I mean, mm. this has gone on for a long time. We get three pages. And then this is in the New York Times this week that, that, that they released three pages of this report that tell us exactly what we've been told last week. There was no new news coming out of this. So my question is, how long is this going to take? How many resources is this really worth? And for Fonnie Willis, I got to say, she's in a politically difficult situation. She may be a bit in a corner here because she's going to get pushed back from the right if, mm -hmm. if they over indict or it is perceived as being political prosecution. And I'm with Martha. I think that she has integrity. I don't think that she is politically motivated. I, I do think that her heart's in the, in the right place on this. But if she doesn't indict anybody or not the ones that the left wants to indict, 
she may have a problem with her own Democratic voter base in Fulton County. So I'm looking at the politics of it more than the substance of it. And Bobby, the, the big question for a lot of people, what might this mean for Donald Trump? Right. The question is, is he going to get indicted? I mean, the other things are interesting. Rudy Giuliani, Lindsey Graham, mm -hmm. the other kind of bit players in this whole Georgia saga. Um, but the big question is, is the former president of the United States going to be indicted uh, by uh, Fonnie Willis? And well, I don't have any more answer than anybody else here does. But I, I do think it's interesting that she went to the court originally to not seal or, or to keep sealed some of the names and, and, and information. You don't do that unless you're planning to potentially indict somebody. So I assume we'll see some indictments. I, I have no idea whether it will be the president of the United States or if it will be uh, some of the, the people that were surrounding him during this big lie. That just take, Let's take it back. Let's remember what we're talking about here for a second. The man tried to overthrow a United States presidential election. He tried to steal an election. He tried to call the secretary of state in Georgia, the president of the United States, and tell him to find 11,000 votes for him. That is illegal. It is immoral and it is completely against the Constitution of the United States of America. And this is what Fonnie Willis has to worry about. Exactly. Okay, it's this exactly attitude right, right here. That's exactly right. I mean, right. this is this is the perfect example of that because let me just tell you what's going to happen. And I'm I don't mind going out on a limb. Mm -hmm. Okay, it won't be President former President Donald Trump indicted because we don't do that here in America. Okay, there have been plenty of opportunities for presidents to be indicted on different things. Remember a little guy named Richard Nixon. Mm -hmm. Remember other other problems out there. But unfortunately, some smaller players will be indicted because she's got to indict somebody. Okay, and it's not going to be the former president as much as some people might want it to be. Oh, I'm not saying that he should be <laughs> indicted necessarily. I'm just saying it, it, we have to, I, I don't know the legality surrounding what his phone calls, and I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a district attorney, I'm not a prosecutor. Oh, this has nothing but to do with legal, though. No, this is all I political. <laughs> and, and political prosecution should not be done on either side, J just like when Brian Kemp's uh, ethics committee went after uh, Stacey Abrams for the same kind of thing. So I'm just saying, in general, it should be looked at like it, it is right now. I am have total confidence it's being looked at by the law. <laughs> Was there a law broken? But in general, I'm saying just as a, it's a human being and citizen of this state and this country, what we saw was ridiculous. I think somebody interfering with a federal election is a federal offense, not a Fulton County offense. And at a time when we had this ginormous judicial backlog of violent criminals in Fulton County because of COVID and the shutdown, we've had a revolving door. And that needed to be the focus coming out of COVID is that. I'm not saying that what Donald Trump said on that phone call was ethical or what he should have been saying. I don't know if it was against the law. I mean, it certainly went up to the line, but there were no specific actions of, uh, of fraud requested. I mean, find me 11,000 votes. You could say what he was saying was, I know there's this much fraud out there. Go, go find the fraud. Okay, is that illegal? No. Unseemly? Yes. But there were other things that could have been focused on. Melina? Well, I have no doubts that if Fonnie Willis determines President Trump was guilty of an offense under the RICO statute, she will be bold enough to indict him. Whether that will happen remains to be seen. But if somebody um, questions her bold ability to go after Trump, I think they're mistaken. All right, we'll make that the final word. <laughs> and of course, Idea Willis has indicated that the decision on whether to bring charges is imminent. Well, coming up, former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley announcing her president to run, now going to head to head with her former boss, former President Donald Trump, in the Republican primary. And opponents of Atlanta's Public Safety Training Center head to court to try to stop the project. We'll discuss when we come back. Have a question or comment for the Georgia Gang? Email them at georgiagang at foxtv.com. Former South Carolina Governor and UN Ambassador Nikki Haley announced her candidacy for president on Tuesday, becoming the first major challenger to former President Donald Trump for the 2024 Republican nomination. Now, Martha, Nikki Haley enters the race after having previously said she wouldn't run if Trump sought re-election. And Haley was once a fierce Trump supporter but broke away from him after the Capitol riot. Yeah, I think that, look, everybody kind of thought she was going to get in. And there have been plenty of politicians who say they're going to do something. And then 
situations change, things change. But I gotta tell you, the best moment for me was Don Lemon the other night on CNN saying that she was past her prime. Oh, that he had Googled it. I heard it. he got a little bit of heat he for that. He had Googled it, <laughs> and a woman is past her prime after her 20s, 30s, or 40s. You well, know, I there disagree was, with that. I disagree <laughs> with that, too. <laughs> and it's so funny because there was a song, I'm Past My Prime, from the Beverly Hillbillies from Ellie Mae Clampett, and that's really what Don Lemon sounded like. <laughs> uh, but he did make a gracious apology. But I think Nikki Haley is going to get in the race. She's going to make it interesting. Uh, and then we're going to see who else gets in the race. But the more people that get in the race, the better it is for former President Trump. And that's why he welcomed her into the race. Yeah. And Bobby, in announcing her uh, presidential campaign, Haley said it's time for a new generation of leadership and called for mandatory competency tests for politicians older than 75. Now, some say that was a direct strike at both former President Trump and President Biden. Well, I think everybody up on this panel can tell you politics is not a meritocracy, okay? <laughs> and it never has been and never will be. Um, I, I completely agree with something you said. This may come as a surprise, but <laughs> that, that Donald Trump is going to be the nominee of the Republican Party coming up if 10 people are in this race. We saw this in 2016. You saw, if you see Nikki Haley get in, there's another person from South Carolina, Senator Tim Scott's probably about to get in. There's, you know, a handful of others, Mike Pompeo and on and on the list goes. Chris Christie's looking at it. Uh, what you're gonna have is, is you're gonna have 10 people and Donald Trump, and you're going to have it come down to like two or three people in when it gets widowed down to like Iowa and New Hampshire. And then you're gonna see uh, those two people being too selfish to be willing to get out of the race. And Trump's gonna keep winning. And, and by the time they figure it out, it's too late. Trump's gonna be the nominee. And he's the one guy I know Joe Biden can beat. Brian? I don't know that I totally agree, but there's certainly a grain of truth in what Bobby is saying, <laughs> a big concern. A man-to-man -man battle or woman-to-man battle in the Republican primary, I think Donald Trump would be in very serious trouble in today's atmosphere. Look no further than Georgia, which made a big statement about the decline in Trump's political capital last year when it gave Brian Kemp and the other Republican incumbents massive victories over Trump's endorsed candidates. So there has been some weakening of the brand, but if it's a big field, it definitely plays to Trump's favor because Republicans, unlike Democrats, uh, are winner take all. The Democrat primaries yep. are proportionally uh, allocated, le letting some of the further back candidates stay alive for longer in the race. So that that is a danger. Nikki Haley is extremely talented. What she did in the wake of the Charleston shootings was so powerful and moving. She handled it with such charm and uh, grace. And grace. It was just so well done. Are we going to see that on the campaign trail, or are we going to see somebody who was against Trump? And then all in for Trump, and then against Trump, and then uh, and then uh, all in and, and against again. So she's she's got to figure out what her lane is because she's been defined to some degree for the last six years by her relationship to Trump. And Melinda, I see you shaking your head no there. Well, I think that Nikki Haley will soon become last month's ice cream flavor of the month. Mm. And I, I think that she was greeted with a lot of misogyny. There are a lot of questions precisely about what Brian was just talking about, where she really stands. Because if there's no racism, as she now says, why did she remove the Confederate flag, for example, after the Charleston shooting? But I think the most startling thing about her announcement was the way Trump reacted to it when he said that he had appointed her to the United Nations Post only to make McMasters the governor of South Carolina and to get Nikki Haley out of South Carolina. That showed such a massive disregard and dismissal of foreign policy and the United Nations um, that it's just a reminder of why Trump should never have a second term. Oh, I agree with that part. Can I just add one more thing? I agree with Brian in saying that if it becomes a one-on-one -on -one matchup early enough, then there's the potential to, to kind of slay the dragon, so to speak. But I don't see that happening. I mean, you know, politicians are known to be selfish. Let, <laughs> let me add, I went to high school with Nikki Haley, so okay. she's the first person from high school to ever run for president, so this big for that, for that reason. <laughs> Well, I think I think the the Confederate flag thing was one of her finest moments, mm -hmm. though, and how she negotiated that and came to it. The same thing with the Charleston shooting, bringing Boeing to, to Charleston. You know, she had a very good two terms um, uh, as a governor, but she has been equated with Trump or back and forth with that. But I do think she brings a breath of fresh air to the race. We're going to have other people that are going to get in there, and I think it'll be really interesting to see who lines up or who commits early 
you know, it's going to be very interesting to see. Because there's a lot of talk about DeSantis. Meatball Ron? Is that what Trump's calling him now? Well, Ron DeSantis. <laughs> the more Trump goes after Ron DeSantis, the better, the better it Ron is for Ron DeSantis. 100% well, make him the target. The, the interesting thing will be to see if both of them make the ballot in South Carolina, whether South Cal Carolinians choose Nikki Haley or Rick Scott. Tim Scott. Tim Scott. Tim Scott, Tim Scott who, who, is, who is also fantastic and just uh, so good on issues when he's, and he's able to connect with Americans in a way that's great. For Tim either Scott's one of them, amazing. for either one of them, Tim Scott or Nikki Haley, let me just say it's wonderful as a Republican to see people of color in the position to run for president of the United States as a Republican. Yep. All right, we'll leave it there. Uh, up next, culture wars. A controversial Senate bill would prohibit teachers and others from discussing topics like gender identity with a child without their parents' consent. Opponents say it poses a threat to Georgia schools. We'll discuss after the break. Join the discussion on the Georgia Gang Facebook page and watch past episodes on the Georgia Gang YouTube channel. Another topic that continues to grab headlines in Georgia, opponents of Atlanta's planned $90 million public safety training center headed to court Thursday. Uh, the group is now asking a Fulton County Superior Court judge to grant a temporary restraining order to halt work now underway at the site. Uh, the city has started clearing trees off the land and opponents are fighting this effort on two fronts. Uh, the group has already appealed the permit DeKalb County granted Atlanta to begin work at the site, but opponents argue that work continues while the DeKalb County Zoning Board of Appeals weighs their request. It's a lot, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so they are now asking a Fulton County judge to issue a temporary restraining order to stop the work until all legal avenues have been exhausted. And of course, the real concern here is on those who, for those who oppose it, is that they're going to be clearing the trees, moving on with this work, and then should uh, this work, be, if, should there be an order for the work to be halted, you, they say, destroyed the landscape there. Well, and it's not just the landscape, it's the drain off into this river Correct. basin yes. that is an overall project that's a high priority for the county and for environmentalists. And security for the site right now is running 41,500 a day. So the clock is ticking and so is the money meter. There, there's a lot of lessons for county and city government to learn moving forward from the ways this has been mishandled. Well, I think they're gonna they're not gonna win in court on this. This project is gonna go forward because it's needed for all the reasons that Mayor Dickens has talked about it and and the way the governor's talked about it. So I think it's gonna move forward. And we want to move on and very quickly uh, address another um, topic that is getting a lot of attention here. Uh, the proposed Parents and Children Protection Act of 2023, also known as Senate Bill 88, which would prohibit teachers and others from discussing topics like gender identity with a child or a child's sexual identity without written permission from parents. Now, it also says that public and private schools cannot change records of a child's name, sex, or gender without written permission from parents. Now, Brian, uh, Senator uh, Cardin Summers sponsored the legislation and said the bill is about protection, that it's about allowing people to know what is being taught to their children. That's right. And I think what we're seeing here is the erosion of trust in the public schools that has really accelerated since COVID. When parents were hearing the curriculum piped in through the computers every day for the first time and going, huh, well, I don't like that so much. And that's really, I think, the bottom line of this is there's a, a lack of trust and a feeling that an agenda is being pushed. I am very leery of broad strokes that really handcuff people in the classroom who are doing heroic work every day. I don't want them to live in fear of uh, prosecution or retribution from uh, the parents or from schools. But at the same time, a lot of this material that we're talking about here isn't something that kindergartners, first graders, and second graders should be talking about. No matter what your ideological views on it are, they need to be learning, you know, X's and O's and ABC's at this juncture, not about Y chromosomes and X chromosomes. I will just say, as, as, as you are, as a parent of first graders, it's not something they are talking about. And I also think that the legislature would be wise to use their time on things that actually can affect uh, the, the public in a lot more larger scale way than this. Well, look, I think that, and I am in full disclosure, I'm a member of the State Board of Education representing the 9th District. And the thing is, the fact that we have to say, it should be a no-brainer that any public record that you have of your child, 
should not should reflect what their birth certificate says, what their records say, that kind of thing. I mean, that should be a no-brainer. I mean, if it, there may be a difference, there may be a discussion you need to have with the child, there may be all of that. But documentation related to your child, I don't know about, I'm old enough to remember how serious the, the permanent record was. Okay, so you don't want to have multiple different things in a record like that because it gets used throughout your lifetime. So I think that's a no-brainer. But some of the other stuff I think there ought to be discussions about. The library bill, which is not the library part of this I don't right. think is in mm -hmm. that bill. I, I don't think that librarians should be uh, charged if, if there are certain books in the library, right. but there are books that are not appropriate for certain course, age groups there's, there's, and that yeah. you have to be able to have that discussion. Yeah. It's sad that we need to have a state law, but perhaps yes. we do. Well, but I think the law as written has major issues and it's seen as censorship of what teachers and students can talk about in the classroom and it gives leeway for prosecuting teachers and educators and it does instill the very fears that Brian wants to avoid. So this bill um, needs a lot of work and the the sponsors need to listen to the groups who are bringing those concerns to them instead of dismissively ignoring them. And, and I also yeah. not more than not listening more to the groups than to the taxpayers, which are the parents, because public schools do not exist without taxpayers. I also think that if we're talking, maybe we take a little less focus on what library book is, is being checked out by our student, and maybe a little more focus on the fact that they're not safe when they go to school because of the culture of guns in this country, and and something that needs to be addressed with public safety. Perhaps if they can't get together on anything at the state level, can they not do something for, for the schools, for, for the kids? I mean, it is sickening to send your kids to school in America at this day and age and, not, and wonder and have to worry when you hear a siren go by, boy, was that the school? I mean, and I'm telling you, parents feel that way. And we just and saw it, that on that Michigan is State University's campus. Yes, and yeah. you just saw this in Michigan State. I mean, this is a real issue in America. People from other countries who, who are, are friends with Americans literally talk to them and say, I'm, I'm now concerned about sending my kid to study for university in America because of this. It's, it's gotten that bad. It's absurd. To and we don't fair, care. To be fair, though, and we actually had this discussion in our board meeting on Thursday, was that the violence issues in school are not the gun issues. The gun issues are important, don't get me wrong, but the incidents of violence between students are far higher of students getting injuries that are permanent. They are more individual, okay? They're not mass, and that makes you feel worse when you hear something like that. I, please, I'm not discounting what you're saying, I'm but the overall yes. level of violence in schools is much more student to student than it is these mass shootings. And it's gotten way worse since yes. COVID. That's yes. one of the things yes. that we're beginning to see now as this data is coming out. I do want to point out to Bobby's point, yes, I am a parent of a kindergartner. Yes, it terrifies me. That's why I'm really thankful to Georgia Republicans for putting in hundreds of th uh, thousands of dollars, maybe millions of dollars to uh, secure schools all over the state in their mid-year budget. Yes. And right. an easy Very way to quickly. secure schools is an assault weapons ban because 19 year olds should not be spraying bullets in schools. It's, it's disgusting. Very quickly, Malia. Well, and enshrining hateful messaging into the law empowers bullies in schools. All right. Coming up next, winners and losers. Time now for the week's winners and losers. We're going to start off with Bobby this week, uh, right. your winner. Yes, I'm going to try and keep it positive for a moment here. Uh, I'm just going to do a winner, and that is um, uh, B. Nguyen, B. Nguyen and, and Raphael Warnock, who has selected uh, B. Nguyen, the Secretary of State nominee, to run his uh, state director, be a state director here in Georgia. I think it's a big win for both um, Senator Warnock and for the people of Georgia, because she's a, a great leader, and, and she will be responsive, and she is a, a big piece of the future of the state. All right, Melita. Well, I want to acknowledge the loss of Tommy Dorch, yes. who was the state director, by the way, for Senator Sam Nunn. And at that time, he was the only African-American state director in the, who had ever been that um, in the whole United States Senate. He went on to be associated with the Atlanta Business League and 100 Black Men of Atlanta and America. And so his loss will be deeply felt in the community, as you see in statements from former Mayor Shirley Franklin and current Mayor Andre Dickens. And then I want to call out Charlie Hazlett's column at Trouble in God's Country. He has reviewed some staggering statistics which show that 
30%, 3.2 million Georgians are in the bottom fourth of the nation for per capita income. That gives Georgia a higher percentage of people in that category than any other state. Mm -hmm. And these are statistics which have dropped in the 20 years of Republican rule for the last two decades. Mm -hmm. Brian? My winner is Cobb County Sheriff Craig Owens because my daughter delivered uh, Girl Scout cookies to the Cobb uh, Sheriff's office this week uh, on behalf of Saba Long, our friend who, who bought for them. And Sheriff Owens was so sweet to my six-year-old girl, uh, spent time with her, got pictures with her. She liked him so much that she gave him a hug oh on the goodness. way out, which for her, <laughs> she's more like her dad, kind of personal distance kind of person. She went all in for the hug. So my winner is uh, Craig Owens, because if you're good to my kid, you're my winner. Oh, very nice, very nice. No losers yet, I guess because I'm guest host. <laughs> That's what it is, How about yeah. you, Martha? So, Laura Harris is a longtime uh, watcher of our program, a big fan. Um, she just had a new grandbaby, and she is fighting a valiant fight against cancer right mm -hmm. now. And so, we are thinking about you, and we're so glad you watch uh, every week. And um, Don Lemon is my loser. I'm going to give you a loser, even though he's. Yeah, I have to agree with you. Know, that. I, it's like, I like Don, I mean, but with past that. your prime. I mean, Come on, I did a show with him for a year, number of yeah. years ago. He's a very nice guy. You know better, Don. I've met your mother, okay? Yeah. Um, and then, I, you know, I'm going to go out on a limb here, okay? By South Carolina, Trump and or Biden will not be in this race. Oh, wow. Stay tuned wow. for that. Well, my winner is my son, Michael. His birthday is today, his 19th birthday. Happy birthday, Michael. Love you. <laughs>